Mm. Right. Uh, I'm going to kick off our first 2024 session. Uh, and I welcome everyone for joining us where you're joining it from. Uh, whether it's across the world or it's Norway. And if it's Norway, I hope you have survived the snow like all of us have. Um, so yeah, uh, it's fantastic to see uh, very good names up here. Some of them are uh, I'm familiar with. Uh, so it's starting off featuring Andy Cutler, a renowned uh, independent consultant and a Microsoft MVP. And he's going to give us insights on Fabric and Synapse Analytics Showdown, finally. Um, it's going to cover some good insights on um, on how these two platforms shape up the future of data analytics. So, but before we jump into technicalities, uh, we want to give Andy the floor to share his personal journey, journey, and offer you know good valuable insights uh, how he's been entered in the tech industry, you know how he started with Microsoft, and how he became MVP. So yeah, Andy, floor is yeah, all sure. yours. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I won't share my screen just yet, but. Um... So my journey really has been over the last 20 years. So it's probably been about 22, 23 years. My first job was a web designer where I was hand coding HTML and ASP. I got asked whether I wanted to get involved in the data side of things. So there was a brand new SQL Server 2000, which I know isn't the oldest version of SQL, but that was the one that I started using. So obviously I had to learn all about database normalization. Then very quickly after that, I got into the world of data warehousing at another company where I was asked, did I want to shadow this consultant who was at the time implementing a product called MicroStrategy and implementing something called dimensional modeling that I had absolutely no idea what that was. And then I learned to unlearn everything that I'd done with transactional databases, denormalization, introducing redundant data for dimensions. And I was just fascinated and that just stuck with me ever since. <clears throat> and I've worked through the Microsoft stack. So, you know, SSIS and SSRS and SSAS and SQL from, well, from those days of 2000. Um, 2005 was probably my first big project with Microsoft technology, upgrading DTS packages to SSIS and creating analysis services models. Stuck with that all the way through until probably 2015, when I started to take more notice of Azure. Before then, it was AWS, right? So I had worked with tools like Redshift, for example, the large scale data warehousing because, and I think Microsoft will agree, they didn't really have anything like that yet on Azure. But as 2016 uh, rolled on, Azure SQL Data Warehouse was released. So I then did migration projects for that service for Azure SQL Data Warehouse. And then of course that's then morphed into Synapse Analytics and Fabric. So I've been quite cloud focused for the last few years, um, but SQL Server has always been you know, a cornerstone of any work that I do as well. MVP, so that started maybe four years ago, some, something like that, when, and I'm gonna be honest, I was doing a master's degree in uh, data, so data, um, data technology. And I wanted to do a master's thesis on the lake house. And at the time, Synapse was released and I thought, great, I'm going to do my thesis on lake houses and data technologies using Synapse. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't really able to do that. I switched it to you to, to Databricks, basically. But I started to blog about Synapse because I couldn't really find that much information out there. So I blogged a lot about serverless SQL pools. I created a lot of sessions around that as well. And I think that kind of put me on the roadmap for the MVP. So I'm not saying that it's always about finding, you know, a niche, but it's 
if you're looking at something and you're trying to find some information and you're not really finding much of what's useful to you, I think that's a really good entry point for, you know, blogging, doing your own sessions um, and things like that. So I think that's been my journey to date so far. Um, I, I think one of the one of the things that I wanted to say is about learning all of this stuff, because a few years and years and years ago, I think it was a bit simpler to learn the technology of the day. So I remember a boss of mine literally just putting two books in front of me. It was SQL Server 2000 Development and SQL Server 2000 Administration. And he said, read those two books and you're up and running. Now, there's so much information out there, so many learning resources that it can be a bit, you know, bewildering at times. And I do think and it's not just Microsoft, you know, Databricks and Snowflake, vendors have embraced the fact that the better their documentation and the better that their learning platforms are, the more people are going to engage with their software. So in the last few years, Microsoft have done some great things with their Learn platform. So there's lots, <clears throat> lots of great content on Learn around Synapse Analytics, around Fabric, any of the technologies within Azure that really give you a jumping off point in learning. So I always, always, always point people towards Microsoft's Learn documentation to get started with any of this, really. Um, yeah, so that's that's been my journey. Yep, that's quite inspiring, to be honest. Uh, and I, I we all get some some uh, at some point some sort of messages how to start with data analytics and how to mm. start with Microsoft and and the very well made point to be honest uh, that look into the learn documents they have uh, written down from the, everything from the scratch. Uh, so yeah, yeah, they have. Who? With that, I'll give you the floor uh, to start off your session, and we would be in the background helping you out. Cool. No problem. I mean, if you want to jump in, if there's any questions or anything that you feel, uh, um, you know, feel relevant, I like to keep it interactive. If there's any questions, so you know, feel feel free to jump in. I don't really work off a, a script that I have to hit certain, you know, certain points. So please feel free. Firstly, can you see my slide deck? Yep. Brilliant. OK, let's go. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year 2024. I kind of feel that 23 went by <laughs> really quickly. Um, but anyway, thank you. I mean, Panik, thank you for reaching out to invite me into the uh, the Norway user group for, well, Synapse Analytics, but Fabric, because Yes, 2023 was a big year for Microsoft in releasing not only into public preview, but to make it generally available again, Microsoft Fabric. What this session isn't is a point by point breakdown of all the differences between the two services, because we could be here for quite a while. I'd like to cover what Synapse Analytics is from a service perspective and the same for Microsoft Fabric. I want to look at a common pattern in terms of the lake house, which has been getting quite ubiquitous now in terms of a data platform for delivering analytical solutions. But the main bulk, I want to get into a demo. And really, the demo is going to be how these two services can actually work together. And the reason that I'm doing this is because not everything is there yet in Fabric. So we don't have the ability to connect to a lot of data sources. The other thing, people have made investments within Synapse Analytics. And you really don't need to just chuck everything away just because there's something else that's appeared. I think that's one of the things that people can get a little worried about in terms of this technology is, oh, are we now supposed to be just completely getting rid of all our old stuff and using the new stuff now? No. So I want to go through how these services can work together and some of the idiosyncrasies as well. As long as my audio is coming through, OK. 
Good stuff. Yeah. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Pudi already uh, introduced me. So I'm just an independent um, consultant around well, the Microsoft data platform. Really, that QR code is to my Twitter. That's where I have most conversations about any of this stuff, really. Data warehousing, Synapse, Fabric. I blog mostly at serverlesssql.com. So that's where all of my Synapse and Fabric blogs are found. And the last thing, shout out to Data Toboggan. So data toboggan.co.uk. So I'm a co-organizer, which started as a Synapse Analytics conference. And we've incorporated the Fabric Synapse side of things. Because Fabric is quite a big product with lots and lots and lots of features in there, we concentrate really on the data engineering and data warehousing side of things. We touch on Power BI and machine learning and data integration, but we like to concentrate on that uh, on that bulk. So our next conference is on Saturday, February the 3rd. So you'll find all the information on, on datatoboggan.co.uk. So today's agenda, yes, we're going to have a look at, well, what is Synapse Analytics and what is Microsoft Fabric? In the demo, we're going to go into those interfaces as well. So you can see, well, what does Fabric look like and what does Synapse look like from a GUI perspective? The service mapping, so we'll probably spend a good few minutes on that page just to have a look at, from a top level, how you can map the services in Synapse Analytics to Microsoft Fabric. It's not as easy as a one-to-one -one mapping. There's some explanation to be done in there as well, because it isn't a like for like, but we'll go through that. And then a lake house architecture, again, very high level, looking at what you would do in Synapse Analytics and what you would be looking at doing in Microsoft Fabric. And then, yeah, we'll jump in to a demo because that's where I like to spend most of my time, really. <clears throat> OK, so Synapse Analytics. Now I'm going to read out this top line. OK, this isn't death by PowerPoint, but I want to read out this top line. Azure Cloud Analytics Service, which brings together data warehousing, big data analytics, data integration, machine learning and real time streaming. Brilliant. Right. So this was released public preview towards the end of 2019 and went generally available in 2020. So it's less than five years old. It's platform as a service. OK, so that's one of the major differences between Synapse and Fabric. Platform as a service means you have more control over the services that you're provisioning within Azure. And that also comes with a bit more responsibility for networking, for security, for locking things down as well. Basically, in Synapse, we've got the SQL pools. So Microsoft took Azure SQL Data Warehouse that was itself Parallel Data Warehouse and renamed it Dedicated SQL Pools and put it into Synapse Analytics front and center as the large scale data warehousing solution. So the SQL based data warehousing solution. They introduced a new service, serverless SQL pools, a service in which you can use T-SQL to query data in Azure Data Lake, in storage, in Cosmos DB and data exported from the Dataverse, it doesn't hold any data itself. It's simply, well, it's a metadata repository, really, for you to run SQL commands against. They added Spark pools for the world of data engineering and, yeah, world of the lake house in terms of processing data through different zones. Spark clusters or Spark pools got added into Synapse Analytics. And then later on, they added Data Explorer. So this is the world of Custo and real-time streaming. OK, so dedicated, serverless, Spark and Data Explorer. All right, so there were four services that got added into Synapse Analytics, all with their own 
syntax, all with their own idiosyncrasies. We had pipelines based on data factory. So this was able to move data around, to load data from many different sources, transform that data and land it into dedicated SQL pools, Data Explorer, Azure Data Lake. We also added Power BI. So when we talk about Fabric, so there's, there's something I want to mention there about, well, <laughs> many people notice this as well. But in Synapse Analytics, we got the ability to create Power BI data sets, which really all it meant was a link to open Power BI desktop. So it was a, a PBITS file or a PBIDS file, which is a, a data source connection file. So nothing fancy. You were still modeling your data within Power BI desktop, deploying it to a Power BI workspace. But you could create reports within Synapse Studio. To be honest, I didn't really see many people ever doing that. All right. So just keep keep that keep that thought in mind of bringing Power BI into Synapse. And of course, we had a Synapse Studio, so we had a GUI. So this is where data engineers and data warehouse developers would spend most of their time. You could be developing, you could create, be creating pipelines, notebooks, so on and so forth. Now, there were other services that you could use with this. So, for example, Azure Data Studio, VS Code, so we could author notebooks that were attached to Synapse Analytics. And by and large, it was a bringing together of several different services. So why is this important as platform as a service? Well, essentially, we've got control, right? So if we have identified dedicated SQL pools are the tool of choice for our particular scenario, we've got a large multi terabyte warehousing or SQL based warehousing solution, then dedicated SQL pools are where that's at. But you can control a lot of things about dedicated SQL pools, the compute tier. So you can start from a very small instance of dedicated SQL pools that are really only for development purposes and scale it up to huge volumes. And when we're talking hundreds of terabytes of RAM, not just storage, but RAM. But with that, you also had to deal with table distributions. So when you were loading data, when you were creating tables, you would have to tell dedicated how Am I distributing this data? I'm distributing this data on a specific column. You had to worry about distribution to make sure that you weren't skewing data across dedicated 60 distributions. So you had to you know, take care about what you were doing with your tables. Of course, we have cluster sizes in Data Explorer, so we can create Data Explorer pools and you know, we can uh, we can configure sizes there. The same with Spark pools as well. So we're able to configure Spark, create Spark pools, configure those, add libraries, Spark versions, so on and so forth, and pipelines, the so data factory. So we can control the compute within there as well. There were different cost structures per service. So the way that dedicated SQL pools was charging you was different to serverless SQL pools. The serverless SQL pools embrace this on demand pricing. Only you only get charged for the amount of data that you're processing. Dedicated SQL pools charged you for, well, the tier of your service and how much data was being stored in that service. And Spark pools were charging you based on well, how many nodes you had and how big those nodes were. We come to Fabric. And no, I haven't made a mistake. So Azure Cloud Analytics Service, which brings together data warehousing, big data analytics, data integration, machine learning, and real-time streaming. I'm having a bit of fun there, really, OK? Yes, Microsoft Fabric has changed, but ultimately, it's still a service that's bringing together the things that Synapse Analytics did. But really, they've done it the other way around. So, yes, we're now adding significant functionality to a Power BI tenant or what we're now calling a fabric tenant. So we've added in data engineering technology, we've added in data warehousing technology into a Power BI tenant. 
underpinned by a service that Microsoft, from a marketing perspective, like to call, you know, the the, the OneDrive for your data, which one lake is essentially a logical data lake, where under the hood it's Azure Data Lake Gen 2, or certainly accessible via Azure Data Lake Gen 2 APIs. But all those services, so the warehouse service, the lake house service, the real-time streaming custo DB service, they're all underpinned by this one lake storage. And we're purchasing compute in the form of capacity units, CU. For example, you can buy Azure-based fabric compute starting at you know a couple of hundred dollars a month. Very, very small instance of fabric. You're not being charged for all of the different services that you're using. So if you're creating a lake house or a warehouse or a custo database, you're going to be charged based on your capacity units. So it's a much easier purchasing method. It's a little bit more involved in finding out exactly how much your workloads are actually costing you out of your capacity units. I mean, Microsoft have got a, you know, a couple of versions of the Fabric Capacity Metrics app that I think need to be advanced a little bit more to help people identify how much things are costing in their tenant. <clears throat> um, this is where control starts to get a little bit uh, hazy. You're losing control here because it's software as a service, right? So you don't have the ability to scale your lake house service. You don't have the ability to scale your warehouse service. It's all been taken away from you. Spark is still configurable. So you can still go in and configure Spark clusters and tell it what type of Spark clusters, how big the nodes should be, how many nodes it should auto scale out. But from a SQL perspective, we've got no got no control over that anymore. And the biggest departure is that the storage is now based on the Delta Lake format. Now we can store different data types within a fabric lake house. So we can store images, we can store CSVs. But when we start creating tables in the warehouse and when we start creating tables in the lake house the rec for the lake house recommended approach is using the delta lake format for the warehouse you've got no you've got no alternative right so microsoft have gone in on the delta lake format and yeah all services run under a, a single a single co uh, a cost model so when you create a fabric capacity or you buy a fabric capacity and you assign that to your tenant, any workspaces that you've assigned to that capacity will be using these capacity units. There's not separate billing charges. Um, now, service mapping. Now, you're going to have to indulge me here a little bit because it's not really like for like. And there have been some advancements in what Microsoft have done between Synapse Analytics and Fabric. But essentially, if we start with dedicated SQL pool, OK, so what I'm going to do is that is your SQL based service, right? So you wrote SQL to create your objects in a dedicated SQL pool to load your objects as well if you were using syntax like copy date, copy into, so on and so forth. But it was a SQL based service. The equivalent in Fabric is a warehouse. The warehouse is a SQL based service. Spark isn't used to work with the warehouse service here. But the caveat is that it's not the same technology. So the warehouse service in Fabric is actually based on the serverless SQL pools engine, which is itself based on a, a concept called uh, Polaris, which is a auto scale, fault tolerant, distributed engine. 
sounds like Spark to me, but it's basically a way of provisioning compute nodes to work with data, but it's SQL based. The difference with serverless SQL pools from Synapse is that they were read only. You couldn't actually, well, you could write data, but it was very basic. The warehouse service in Fabric has full CRUD capabilities. You can create your tables, you can read, you can update, you can delete, you can insert data, all using SQL. Spark pools, well, yes, we can code Python, Scala, SQL, R, and in our Fabric environment, we've got clusters. I think in Fabric, it's separated the compute a little bit more than Synapse Analytics. What I mean by that is, in a Synapse Analytics workspace, you could create Spark pools. You could just have a list of Spark pools. OK, fine. In Fabric, the Spark pools are actually allocated to a workspace. And in the world of Power BI and Fabric, we can have multiple workspaces. So you can have multiple Spark clusters of different types in multiple workspaces to meet whatever workload you need. And when I say, you know, indulge me, this is the bit that I mean. In Synapse, a new feature got rolled out called Lake Databases. And these were Spark focused databases. You worked with them using Spark. So you could create these databases, you could populate these databases essentially with data that was stored in Azure Data Lake Gen 2. It wasn't, uh, you know, you weren't ingesting into any proprietary engine or anything like that, but it was a Spark based object. You're using Python, Scala, SQL, R, etc. In the world of Fabric, we've got lake houses, so files and tables. So we're loading files, so it could be you know CSV files, images, whatever, into a lake house file area, which yes, it's un, you know it's underpinned by one lake and Azure Data Lake Gen two. We've also got the ability to create tables in a lake house well database really but this is all spark focused right so all the lake databases in synapse they were spark lake house files and tables the way you're manipulating them again in fabric is spark we come into serverless sql pools now in the world of synapse it really was a read-only service you were only using it to read data from a data lake possibly cosmos db I, again i never really saw many people doing that yes there was a there was write functionality but like i said it was very basic and it wasn't really used that often but it's a sql based service the equivalent in fabric is the lake house sql endpoint which is read only so it's like the lake databases and the serverless sql pools databases have been you know merged into the lake house but you're still having to switch to a sql endpoint to write sql read only sql against your lake house tables and the interesting thing is they're actually very similar under the hood so when you created a lake database and you created a table there was metadata synchronization that went that went on you know under the bonnet that would make those tables available within serverless SQL pools for querying. So what you could do is you could use Spark to engineer your data, you know, and use the lake databases for you know inserts and so on and so forth. Your Spark clusters would switch off. Then you could use serverless SQL pools to query the same data using the same lake database, but it was using the serverless SQL pools engine. So with Fabric, it's the same thing. So when you're creating tables in a lake house, what it does is it also synchronizes metadata for it to be available in the SQL endpoint. So sometimes that metadata synchronization, then there could be a problem with it. Whereas a table you've created in a lake house it doesn't work in the SQL endpoint, right? 
So I want people to to understand that it's it's almost it's the same process that's going on behind the scenes. Probably not technically, but the same logical process. So in terms of common patterns, OK, so I'm going to look at the lake house architecture. So I'm going to dismiss dedicated SQL pools, which is the SQL based large scale data warehousing um, service. And we'll look at Synapse Analytics and Fabric in terms of the lake house architecture because they're not hugely different. But in the world of Synapse, we've got Spark pools, so we can essentially run notebooks, okay, write our Py, write PySpark, write our Scala to process the data, and use pipelines and data flows to sequence those notebooks, store that data in Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage. We can then use serverless SQL pools to create essentially a logical data warehouse on top of the data that's stored in Azure Data Lake and deliver that to Power BI. So load semantic models and deliver reports. In the world of Fabric, all of this becomes more integrated and within the fabric ecosystem so we can create notebooks pipelines data flow gen 2 not a million miles away from what we what we could do in synapse analytics and we're loading those into a lake house so we can populate the files area we can populate the tables area of a lake house within fabric using pipelines using notebooks and data flow gen 2. We feed a semantic model downstream. Now, one of the advancements that Microsoft has made is a new connectivity method, which is direct lake, which is the ability for you know a Power BI semantic model to read in well real time. There's some caching going on behind the scenes. Uh, the data that's stored within the lake house itself. So the delta tables, so it's bypassing the SQL based services within Fabric to go directly to the compressed data and bring it straight into the semantic model. There's a lot of caveats and I hope that these are going to be overcome, you know, in, uh, you know, in the um, in the foreseeable future. So, for example, if you take the warehouse service within Fabric, you can implement object level and row level security. However, that breaks Direct Lake. You're not able to use Direct Lake with features like that yeah, in the warehouse. And then we're feeding reports downstream. So you can see that we're doing all these things in Synapse. We can do all these things in Fabric. And by and large, we can do the same. We can do the same sort of thing. However, with Fabric, it's much more integrated. So within a single workspace, you can create your lake house, you can create your notebooks and pipelines to load your data. Whereas a little bit more heavy lifting in Synapse Analytics to get the services to talk to each other. So what I want to do is I want to look at using both services together. And the reason is Fabric doesn't have everything there yet in terms of connectivity in things like pipelines. People may also have made investments within Synapse Analytics and yeah, may want to leverage some of the features with, within Fabric and not throw away what they've all already done in Synapse Analytics. So we can talk, the services can talk to each other. Um, so we'll do that. We'll do that now. So what I'll do is I'll bring my screen up. So can you see my screen? Okay, getting some nods. Right, so what I'll do is I've already created um, um, an app registration because I need a service principle to let Synapse Analytics talk to Fabric. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to create a lake house. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. 
and we'll say new lake house right and uh, i'm going to call it synapse lake house let's create that lake house <clears throat> And then really quickly, I'm just going to show a manual uploading of a file and a manual creation of a table. Really basic stuff. So I'll say raw. And I will. I'm going to say desktop because I'm going to get some data. From my computer. So let's just upload files. Let's go to uh, desktop. Where's my desktop? Desktop. Um, and I've got a parquet file that I'm just going to upload. Pretty small file. And that just exists in my files area of my lake house. Right. So it's the files area is where I can go and put all of my different types of data. Now, it doesn't have to be tabular data. It can be images. If you're going to do any kind of machine learning on those um, audio, video. Whatever. But from a querying perspective. I would like to load that file into my tables area, so I'm just going to use the GUI to load to tables. I'll say a new table. All right, let's just get rid of the uh, the, the uh, full stop. Load that in. And this is the most basic way of getting some raw data into a lake house and then creating a table with it. I don't know how long that's going to take to do that. While it's doing that, I want to bring up, yeah, let's let it do its thing. Um, I'd like to bring up Azure. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it did it, uh, did it quite quickly. Um, so if I click on the table, it's going to give me a preview of that uh, of that data. There we go. I'm not going to go into the details of the data too much, but. We've got our raw file here in our files section. And we've created a table. Which has if I view the files. OK, so this is a delta table, so we've got a transaction log. So this is what underpins um, the warehouse at uh, the lake house and warehouse service. I've got parquet files, right? But I've. The data has been copied. The data has been copied from files into the tables. Now I can work with this data. So I can go into my SQL endpoint. So I'm going to go into my SQL analytics endpoint. And now I get a much more familiar SQL based experience where I've got schemas, views, functions and and stored procedures. Now uh, don't be fooled by the fact that there are things like stored procedures there. Yes, we can write stored procedures in a SQL analytics uh, endpoint. Uh, we still can't write data. Yes, yeah? so this is a read only service. I can I can run SQL queries. I'm not going to do that now, but. I will click on reporting. This is the only time I'll open a report for any visualization perspectives. But I'll click a new report. Ask me to log in. And then I can, let's say, I can visualize account type and put in counts. OK, so far, so good. It's probably uh, nothing groundbreaking that anyone's seen before in terms of fabric. You know, we've gone from a raw file to a delta table to a visualization. Now, in terms of interoperability between Synapse Analytics, and fabric, we can use the one lake service. We can read and write to a lake house within fabric using Synapse Analytics. 
And what I've seen this being used for recently is to augment a data pipeline process that's already running in Synapse to also make the data available within Fabric itself, within one lake. Yeah, because there are ways and means within Fabric. So if I flick back to, I won't do it now, but within my lake house, if I switch back to uh, my lake house, I'm able to create shortcuts, which are incredibly useful. So if I have data in separate Azure Data Lake services, I can go and get that data. I can also get it from Amazon S3 and other parts of One Lake as well. Very useful if you don't want to move the data between locations. So if we switch to Synapse now, so I'm just going to switch over to my uh, Synapse environment. So I've got some data in an Azure data lake. And when I talked about what you can't do within Fabric at the moment within pipelines, there's lots of data sources that aren't available. So you could be working with Salesforce, you could be working with you know, any number of third parties or data sources that are not yet available within Fabric. However, pipelines within Synapse are pretty mature. Data Factory certainly is. So everything you can do here within pipelines in Synapse, you can also do in Data Factory. But if I look at my sales data, I've got a whole bunch of data and it's in Parquet. I'm just going to keep using the DIM account um, data for the time being. But suffice to say, this is in an Azure Data Lake Gen 2 account. I can shortcut this data into Fabric, but pretend that this data is from a service that isn't yet supported within Fabric, or it's part of an existing pipeline in which you want the data available within Fabric, and especially within One Lake, and the new optimizations like V order that can be applied to data that's been loaded into One Lake. So if I look at Synapse, so I'm going to click on the entry point for Synapse Analytics. So this was Synapse Studio. And yes, we had a visualized button for Power BI, but pretty basic in here. We can go to uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to create a connection to Fabric. So within my manage uh, section, I've got linked services and basically linked services. Same thing that we're doing within Fabric in terms of linking to the data sources and services that we want to connect to. In that linked service, we have Fabric. We've got the lake house. Yes, yeah, so we don't have the warehouse. We've got the lake house. So I'll show you the two ways in which we can work with the lake house within Synapse. So from here, I'll call it uh, Fabric Lake House. And at the moment, you'll only be able to connect to your Fabric Lake House from Synapse using uh, a Synapse workspace that's been configured with inside a managed virtual network. There are some cost implications to that as well. So this is just what I want to make people aware of. So it's not supported if your Synapse analytics is not configured in a managed VNet. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, switch on the interactive authoring. I want that 60 minutes. <clears throat> Best practice would be to create a second integration runtime and if you configure a shorter time to live. But while that's enabling interactive authentication, I can select my lake house. So I've got my workspaces, so I can actually select my Norway user group. Uh, for lake house name, well, there we go. There's my Synapse lake house. Um, I can either inline, well, I'm going to inline the credentials. I already pre-created a, a service principle for this. Um, I've got the references in the documentation, so I'll tweet out the uh, the session 
PowerPoint with the links to all this documentation. I could use a credential as well if I'd stored a credential within Synapse, uh, but we'll use inline. So I've got my tenant ID, and if you'll bear with me while I just flick back to my notes. So I'm going to put my service principle ID, and then I'm going to put my key, which I will delete after this. OK, we've just got to wait for that interactive authoring to finish enabling before I click the test connection on there. So one thing I want to do is just open up Azure Storage Explorer. And let's see if. I have failed to get the properties. Let's have a look at. Uh, maybe I have to sign in again. OK, no, I need to sign in. And uh, to do, 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 I just want to see if. Uh, uh, OK, so I really can't get the properties. OK, I'll leave that for the time being. OK, so interactive authoring enabled, which means I can now actually test connections and browse. So if I test that connection. Bring hopefully run for a few seconds. Uh, ah. OK. So what we need to do is in the workspace itself, I'm zoomed in quite a lot. I'll manage access. And oh yeah, there we go. There we go. That's why. So I need to give the service principle that I created in Entra. I need to give that contributor permissions on the workspace. Let's go back to Synapse. Let me test that connection. Don't know how long it will take to uh, to come through. Let's test again. Okay, let's go back to manage access. I think it needs to be an admin on here. Okay. Not sure why we're now getting failures on this. ADLS Gen 2 failed for forbidden storage operation on container, such and such. An operation returned an invalid status, forbidden. Possible root cause. It's possible because the service principal uh, don't, have, don't have enough permissions to access the data. Uh, if you are using private endpoint, it's possible because private endpoint will be created and configured correctly. That, that's fine. It should have been configured correctly. No, there's no firewall settings involved. Test that connection again. There we go. Always takes a few seconds. All right, so let's create that. And now we've got a linked service to our Fabric Lake House. So in terms of a pipeline, now I'm not going to get fancy in terms of for each loops in pipelines and things like that. I'm going to show you two ways to interact with the lake house using synapse pipelines and data factory so i can use copy data right and what i'll do is from a source perspective uh, again pretend this is a source that is not supported within fabric or this is already part of your data processing pipelines um, but i'm just going to connect to 
uh, some data in my data lake account. So I'm going to hit parquet and I'm going to be a little naughty and just browse directly to the data that I want. So we'll go to Data Lake House UK, curated, sales data, and then dim account. Okay, there we go. Pretty simple. Create that connection to that source data. I'll switch to the wildcard because it will be picking up Parquet. On the sync side of things, I'll create a sync data set and you'll notice that I've got two options. So I can write to the files section, but I can also write directly to the table section as well. I'm going to write to files. And well, I'm going to write it as Parquet. So this isn't, and again, I'm saying ignore the source of the data really, because if I wanted to get files into Fabric, I'd just use binary copies. Whereas this is actually going to pick up the data from the data lake and stream it in to Fabric. Okay, so pretend that the data source is something else. So if we pick up from Parquet, then I can select that lake house. Now I can browse. And there we go. So there's my raw folder. And there's that data that I uploaded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click OK and then say, well, actually, I'm going to store it in the Synapse folder. Sorry, I'm going to say non in terms of schema information. And then I'm just going to debug. I'm going to run that. Um, Copy, copy data pipeline. So hopefully, I'm just going to click refresh to see that this is not queuing. And like I said, you know, same process available within Data Factory. So if you're using Data Factory to load data around, you've got the ability to connect into Fabric and load into the Lakehouse and the Files section as well. Uh, so, depending on how long this takes to start up, uh, what I'm going to do in the meantime, I'm just going to duplicate this pipeline. Oh, no, it's still queued. Let's let that uh, let that run for a few seconds. Just zoom in a little bit more. There we go. OK. Come on, come out of queued. I want to see you running. Mm -mm -mm. There we go, in progress. OK, so that shouldn't take long. There we go, succeeded. Let's switch to Fabric. We'll open up our lake house and we'll have a look at the raw section. And we've got our Synapse folder and we've got our Parquet file that we moved across. So again, any sources that are supported within Synapse pipelines and Data Factory, hey, you can make that available within Fabric. The tables section is the interesting one because if I go back to Synapse, I made a copy of the pipeline just so that on the sync, I'm going to change it. So I'm going to now write to the tables section. So if I just want to bypass files and I just want to write into the tables section of fabric so I can just start querying the data or building semantic models from that data, then uh, I'll just select a new data set. And I'll choose tables. Select the same link service. I'm not going to change any names of anything at all. And. I will 
again, you can parameter parameter parameterize all of this. There is no existing table name at the moment, so I am just going to enter that table name manually. A DW dim account, and I will call it Synapse. All right, so we'll just OK that. Oops, switch that import schema non. And let me debug that. We'll probably see that queued up. Um, queued up for a while. So while that's doing that, I'm just going to open up a notebook and just step through it very quickly before we actually run it. Ultimately, I'm just going to hide that menu item. One lake is, well, can be communicated via the Azure Data Lake Gen 2 APIs because that's essentially the technology it's built on. So you will have access to the file or the, the location of your data within one lake. So for example, if I switch back to uh, back to Fabric, I can actually just right click, look at properties of that table, and it's got well, both the HTTPS URL, but also the ABFS path. So if I'm using Spark, then I can use this ABFSS path to both read and write directly into one lake. And in fact, I don't actually need to have Fabric capacity running to be able to do that. To use any of the fabric artifacts, yes, I need fabric capacity running, but I can just directly read and write into one lake without actually having the fabric capacity running. If I go back to Synapse. Um, here we go, go back to Synapse. Uh, so yes, essentially we've got a path to our tables section here. So I'm using the GUIDs because there are spaces in the names of my workspace and uh, well, probably not my lake house. So you're going to have to use the GUID of the fabric workspace and the lake house if there are spaces within the names of your artifacts. But you get the URL anyway with uh, with this. So what I'll do is I will set this running. Um, because Synapse Spark sessions take a few minutes to, to get up and running. Let's go back to that pipeline copy. Okay, let's just uh, zoom out a little bit. Okay, and it succeeded. Okay, brilliant. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at our tables. And we've got a table here. And what's interesting, it's a delta table. So it's created it as a delta table, which is the recommended table format for the table section in a lake house. If I view the files, there we go. I have a parquet file and I've got my delta log, yeah, which shows everything that's happened within this table. It's my transaction log. And there's my data. One thing to note about when you're working with the tables within Synapse in Fabric is that if I go back to Synapse Analytics, there isn't actually anything within the GUI to tell Fabric how you would like to write this data. So anyone familiar with writing da data to, you know, let's say a delta table is you can overwrite the data. So all the incoming data is just going to completely clear out the old data and insert the new data. The old data will still be accessible through you know, the delta time travel, but it will essentially replace it as the current data. We can also append. Right. So if we if we have loading processes where we do not need to change anything in the destination table, we can literally take the incoming data and append it to our destination table. Brilliant. 
happy days. Append is the default for this table connector. So if I was to keep rerunning this process, it's just going to append the rows to that table. So it's going to have, well, it's going to end up with duplicated data in here. So one of the ways that we can do that is just open up the JSON code representation of the pipeline. Actually, let me just uh, go back to the pipeline itself. Open up the JSON representation and then somewhere down here, I'll have the sync of type lakehouse table sync with an option to append. I want to change that to overwrite. Now, when I run this pipeline again, it's going to overwrite the data that's downstream. So that was a bit of a gotcha for me when I was creating a um, process for this. So I just wanted to ask Penny, uh, how much time do I have left? I understand I'm on the hour. Yep, but uh, if you have something exciting, please go ahead. Uh... There's no so like it's mostly here. Yeah, that's fine. So the last few minutes is on the the spark side of things in communicating uh, back and forth. And again, you know, this will work within Databricks as well. So if you've got a Databricks process up and running, it's by and large the same process in terms of being able to read and write data to and from Fabric. You don't have to use Fabric Compute for all of your data processing requirements. So, for example, for any companies or organizations that were understandably concerned that, well, yes, they can run all of these workloads within Fabric. I can create warehouses and lake houses and pipelines and copying routines. But what happens if my data processing all of a sudden uh, swamps my fabric compute and is using up most of my fabric compute. And it's interfering or it's affecting the ability to deliver my reports or semantic models. Well, you could offload the data pro or the data loading processes to data factory. There are you know, ways and means in which you can connect into fabric. Um, so if we look at the notebook side of things, um yep so that yep there we go three minutes and 10 seconds so that was uh one of the issues with synapse based um spark clusters but i've just populated a variable with the table section actually i probably need to update that so here well here's me in you know the norway uh, user group workspace that i created and what i can do is I can take that uh, group string up there. Pop it to my URL there and then go back and there's my lake house skewed. So I'm just going to take that and copy it into there. OK. And I'm pointing at my tables section, right? So let me just run that again. There we go. So very, very quick. I'll read some data in from my data lake. So my Azure uh, data lake Gen 2. Let's um, run that. So again, if it makes sense, so it makes more sense from within Fabric to create shortcuts to your data and read from the shortcuts, by all means, do that. If it makes more sense to do your data processing and push that into Fabric externally, also do that. So let me um, show the output. Um, so there we go. So I've just loaded a data frame from Parquet data that's available within my Azure Data Lake. I can just write that by using the standard you know, data frame syntax of writing. I'm using the format of Delta. Uh, I'm going to overwrite the data. So if I was to repeatedly run this, 
It's just going to overwrite the data that's in that um, fabric table. Um, my one lake path is referencing my lake house in my workspace in the table section. And what I'll do is I'll call that uh, DW dim account synapse spark. So let me run that. And we'll see that job executing. Give that a few seconds to run. Actually, let's flick back to, oh, there we go. Command executed in 14 seconds. Let's have a look. I'll refresh that. And there we go. There's my dim account synapse spark table. Delta format available within Fabric. If I have a look at the view files, then there we go. Got the delta log, everything we expect from a from a delta table. Well, I can read it as well. So again, I'm literally using the same location, except I'm going to read the format of Delta and load from one lake. So let's run that. And let's show the output. And we can read from it as well. So really, the upshot is, you know, it's not a baby with a bathwater type of thing, right? If you have existing pipelines running within Synapse, if you've got existing pipelines in Data Factory, if you've got data that's being moved about, then integrating it this way directly into Fabric using these connectors could be a, could be a way of extending your data platform. Yes, you can use shortcuts within Fabric against Azure Data Lake Gen 2. I'm just using Azure Data Lake Gen 2 as the source data for testing purposes, but there's so many other data sources that Fabric is not supporting yet within pipelines. Um, so if you've already got pipelines set up to you know, scrape data from web services, to get it from third parties, you know, Salesforce, SAP, so on and so forth, that you would like to just extend into Fabric. Yeah, you don't have to recreate everything within Fabric. You've got the option to, well, either do it in Spark, external to Fabric, or with pipelines and, and data factory. So I'll just flick back to my um, PowerPoint. Uh, like I said, I've got the uh, references um, in the um, in the PowerPoint uh, link section, so I'll tweet that out. Um, really straightforward instructions to follow. There is a caveat that I will say, and. Uh, part of Microsoft's documentation points out that you can read data using serverless SQL pools from a one lake delta table. At the moment, I haven't been able to get that to work. I'm speaking with Microsoft about this at the moment. There's some version incompatibility with delta that's being written into one lake that serverless SQL pools, which is a little behind on the Delta version it supports. So there's some issues there at the moment. So if anyone does you know, have a read and sort of test this out, uh, please bear in mind that you, you may get an issue if you try and use serverless SQL pools to talk to the data that's been created in uh, one lake via Fabric. Um, but anyway, well, thank you for listening. I hope it's been useful. Um, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, feel free, you know, reach out, you know, ask any questions you want about any of this. I'm more than happy to answer. Ooh, very big thank you. Uh, and thank you for sharing your expertise and insights. Uh, we do have one question on the chat, uh, if you want to address it, uh, which is like, can you compare Microsoft Fabric to Databricks? Yeah, uh, yes. a classic yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the this is the thing. So that was um yeah, Syed. Um is that 
You've got to say that Microsoft have taken a lot of inspiration from Databricks. I think they themselves would probably uh, would probably admit that. You know, Databricks, they, you know, they came along. I'm not going to say, you know, sort of boutique. You know, that's probably doing Data, Databricks a, bit, a big disservice because if Spark was gathering pace as, uh, you know, a large scale data distribution platform. But it was really when um, people with sm smaller data volumes started to use Databricks that uh, people realized, oh, OK, so it's not a massively specialized product. People who are migrating from, you know, on-premises SQL databases could look at using something like Databricks and Azure Databricks rather than migrating to, an, you know, a Microsoft only based service. So it got really, really popular. And services like dedicated SQL pools, which were very embedded in SQL Server technology, you know, found that ultimately they weren't keeping up with what Databricks were doing. Hence, you know, Fabric comes along, a reworking of the SQL engine in terms of using this new distributed engine that was created for, you know, for, for, for SQL Server, which acts a little bit like Spark in terms of its, you know, scale out, um, scale out compute. Comparing them, I mean, it, it, at Microsoft Ignite, there was, you know, essentially quite a quite a, a big part of it was how well, Databricks and Fabric can work together. So there is a versus story, but there's also a an interoperable story as well. But I mean, I've been hands on with Databricks and from a complete data solution, it's really good because you can build out your or warehousing slash lake housing solutions. Yes, it's you know it's it's back ended by, you know, the Delta format, which is kind of becoming ubiquitous with you know cloud data platform technologies. Power BI, Tableau, data modeling and data visualization services, all connect into Databricks. It's got its own SQL based service, machine learning. I mean it's. I'm not a, a machine learning specialist at all, but it, you know I've I've watched Databricks um, ML sessions and just been blown away by the whole ML ops side of of Databricks. But they've really turned that platform into a into a very comprehensive, you know, all in one. Um, I'd never I'd never be disparaging against Databricks at all. I, I think it's really good. It's all against. It's all about skill set. Right. It's all, it's all about skill set. So you're going to work predominantly with Spark within Databricks. Yes, it has its SQL based services, you know, the SQL warehouse service um, and SQL clusters to, to write SQL and, and visualize data. But, you know, by and large, I think people are, you know, using it for, for Spark. Obviously, with Fabric, it's within the Microsoft ecosystem. So people familiar with SQL Server, it's to get hands on with the warehouse service is yes, there's some caveats, but it's not it's not an insurmountable uh, and stressful journey to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, I'm sort of reluctant on the whole versus side of things because it's going to be based on your skill set. It's going to be based on your direction of travel within your organization of what you know products you want to use. Um, but certainly, well, that's the thing. You could probably use Databricks and get it wrong in terms of how you built it out, but you could also use Microsoft Synapse and Fabric and also build it out wrong as well. Yeah, so it's also the same thing about which is the best cloud platform. Azure, AWS, Google, you can do things right and wrong on all of those platforms. That's just that's just my opinion. Sounds really great. Uh, we have more questions. We check. Uh, I think Linda was asking about, except for missing connections in Fabric, when would you prefer Synapse instead of Fabric if you start a new project? Great question, Linda. If I'm going to be honest, I probably wouldn't start a new dedicated SQL pools 
project. I think now with fabric and warehousing, that's probably a slightly easier service to work with than dedicated SQL pools. However, the thing with fabric is that you get everything within fabric. So, and you have to purchase compute or you have to run compute and you've got then access to all of the items, which is fine if you want to build out, you know, a comprehensive data platform. With Synapse, you can create a Synapse workspace within minutes and only ever use a service like serverless SQL pools, which I've seen more and more where people they want a SQL based service, so they want to use something that they're comfortable with in T-SQL, but they're exporting into you know, a data lake and they've got synchronization jobs that are exporting things into the data lake. They don't want to do any heavy processing. They want to do some transformation and ultimately, yes, they want to aggregate it and land it in something like Power BI or you know, any other BI tool. Um, so those are the sorts of projects that I see being quite useful for Synapse is the sort of lightweight metadata driven projects where you're creating you know, a Synapse workspace, you're populating a data lake, and then you're casting structure over it using you know, serverless SQL pools. And of course, the, with the costing model as well, that on-demand pricing for something like serverless means that you're only gonna pay for the amount of data that you're processing. Um, with Fabric, you're paying for the the tier of service that you're currently on. Now we can go into the concepts of you know smoothing and bursting, which are kind of outside outside of here. So you can create a Fabric capacity and run it at a certain level, and during a 24-hour period, actually exceed how much capacity you've bought, but you've got to pay it back. So when your capacity is quiet, it will kind of smooth it, smooth it out. Um, so that's 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 what I would see. So, you know, if, if I had anyone that was saying to me, oh, you know, we want to build, you know, a, a very simple lake house solution where we're going to be, you know, storing some data in a data lake and then, you know, loaded into Power BI. Fabric probably could be a bit of an overkill. If you're looking to create, you know, a well, let's I, I know, you know, the, the naming of medallion is uh you know sort of controversial in terms of its uh you know of its meaning but you know it is this pattern of loading raw data and then transforming it into cleaner more refined and modeled data through different zones if you've got several of these zones if you've got uh you know if you're looking to build out a platform then fabric makes connecting all of those pieces a lot simpler and what's funny is that you know four years ago four or five years ago you know we were showing you know designs of how to connect this service to this service and what authentication you needed and what network settings you needed to do so on and so forth but now with fabric all of that's taken care of in terms of the service interoperability we're now at the stage of fabric where people are creating patterns, people are creating frameworks. So we're going to see probably see a lot of that emerging this year as well. You know, so we've got the we've got the tool. Fine. How do we then make the most out of it? How do we create reusable patterns? Um, yeah. Exciting. And uh, I hope uh, this has sparked a lot of curiosity. Uh, and excitement uh, about these technologies. Uh, so with that, I think we should end. Um, and thank you for participation and questions. And thank you once again, Andy, uh, for coming along on board uh, to give the session. Uh, to audience, I'll just say keep eye on our community pages. So we're going to update more future sessions. Uh, and we'll continue the journey uh, of exploring more about Fabric or Synapse. Oh, we have one last question from uh, Ravindeer. Yeah. Yes, I was, I was, I was just I, supported. Yeah. Yeah. I just dropped it into the chat actually. So at the moment, yes, you can you can get to it via Dataflow Gen two, but not within data pipelines yet. So 
Um, yeah, I think it's in the roadmap. That's on the roadmap. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. With that, I want to say goodbye and thank you once again. See you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks for inviting me. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. -bye.